Welcome to Engineering Innovations, the official podcast of the Purdue University Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm your host, Kristen Malavenda. I'm the Communications Director for Purdue ECE. Join us each month as we delve into the cutting-edge advancements, transformative research, and insightful conversations shaping the future of this field. Our guest for this episode is Shreyas Sen, Elmore Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Shreyas, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Christian, for organizing this. So we'd like to start with the basics, which is how did you get into electrical and computer engineering, and when did that interest first start showing? Absolutely. So there are two parts to it, you know, first getting into engineering itself and then thinking of electrical and computer engineering part. Um, so the first part came very naturally to me. Uh, you know, as a kid, I used to uh, break my toys a lot. And my mom tells me that's not very uh, abnormal, but I used to put them back together and <laughs> still make it work. Right. And there was an alarm clock that didn't work for the last 20 years. And I was able to make uh, break it and make it work. So and wh what age was that? So that was like f age four. Wow. Four or five, something like that. Pretty early age. You yeah. know, I was just playing with it, did something, and it started. Right. So I don't remember that, but my mom tells <laughs> me that uh, that gave him the sign that I need to be empowered with more engineering toys. And mm -hmm. that's what she started doing, which pulled my interest towards engineering. Gotcha. Then at around grade six or seven, uh, my maternal uncle gifted me two box. Uh, toolboxes with which I could build a calling bell, electronic calling bell, and uh, uh, radio. These radios with you know transistors on them. Yeah. So I was able to successfully build that. And to that transferred my thinking at a very early age that, oh, you can build something that really works and you can tune into the radio channels. That was an enlightenment. Yeah. And that took, uh, you know, stayed with me. Then after 12th, when I had to choose between medical and engineering, it was a relatively clear choice for me for uh, electronics engineering uh, as my career path. Excellent. And I know a lot of your research um, revolves around body internet, they call it. But I want you to explain that, but kind of explain how your research developed into what you're doing today. Absolutely. So at that juncture after my 12th, like I was saying, uh, I got into the uh, best medical school. And a lot of my uh, you know peers said, oh, no, go medical. You will do something that would benefit us. <laughs> if you go engineering, we'll just go off with a you know, high salary job and I will never <laughs> see you. Right. So at that point, but because of my love for the electronics engineering, I chose that. But I also loved biology. So I had kept it in my mind that at some point I would like to merge them together. Gotcha. So uh, after my bachelor's um, at Jadavpur University in electronics engineering, I went to Georgia Tech to do my master's and PhD where I worked on wireless circuits. Okay. So during doing, and I was trying to make them smart, you know, this is like AI for uh, radios. And what I learned is you can do all of that and make it adapt to the environment and things like that, and you can save like 2x energy. But I also learned that wireless circuits are very energy inefficient, that if you want to send one bit through the air, mm -hmm. you take uh, one to 10 nanojoule to do that communication. Okay. To send a bit from place A to place B. Then as uh, you know, life would take you through Intel Fellowship, I joined Intel after my PhD at Intel Circuits Research Lab, where I was working on um, wire line communication, the th communicating through wires like USB. Okay. And um, there what I learned is when you communicate over a medium, it is much more efficient. It's like 1,000 ticks more efficient compared to radiating signals out. So then after five years of that, when I came to Purdue, I had a free, uh, you know, the license to think freely right. and combine my loves and insights. The insight was that if you could communicate over a guided medium, you are going to be thousand x more efficient. Okay. And the love was combined electronics and biology. Yep. So that all came together and they asked, the question naturally came to me, can you use the body as a wire? Yep. And that will be very efficient and secure. Then many, many PhD students later, we have developed that field and um, it works very well that you can sig send signals around the body at 100x lower power compared to your wireless chip. Wow. So this is an implantable chip that you've created or how does it work? Uh, you, it could be an implantable, but it doesn't have to be. The first thing, it is basically wearables. Okay. So uh, today's wearable, when it tries to send information out, uh, it has to take that information, which are digital bits, and put it on an electromagnetic carrier, like mm -hmm. a 2.4 gigahertz for Wi-Fi or BLE, as you would know, right. and radiate it out. So that radiation goes in all around. 
you know, I want to go from my watch to my earbud, let's say, or my pacemaker, uh, if I had one. But this information is going everywhere around the room. Okay. Because I have to radiate the information out. Right. So the question we asked, oh, instead of radiating, body is conductive. Can I just guide the signal around the body mm -hmm. to the destination on my body? Okay. And that's what we have achieved. So any wearable that is touching you or near you, you can think of it as an aura of tiny electrical fields that we are creating around the body and which we can uh, do very high speed, extremely efficient communication. And that can connect all wearables and in future implantables as well. That's that's cool. I think, do you think some people will find it, I don't know if creepy is the right word, but do you get that reaction? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had a TEDx talk earlier when there were two class of people who came up to me and talked. Uh, more than half of the people were like, oh, I, my mind is blown. <laughs> and then a lot of people still were, oh, what about the safety? You mm -hmm. know, are you electrocuting me? Right. So uh, for that, you know, we have done a lot of research to understand what this is, really is. And once you, um, so if you think about it, you know, um, on a winter dry day, you get a shock when mm -hmm. you touch something. Right. That's a lot of charges building on your body, which is, and then discharging through you. Okay. The levels could be thousands of volts. That's the level at which you feel. We use a similar principle, but our um, applied amplitude on the body is only 10 millivolt compared to the thousand of volts that you can feel. Right. So this is orders and orders of magnitude lower compared to where the safety limits are. Gotcha. In fact, because this is so low power, you know, when your cell phone is closer to your, you're talking on a cell phone, it radiates, uh, and that cell phone is trying to talk to your tower, mm -hmm. it radiates about one watt power output okay. at radio frequencies. Even if 10% of that gets absorbed, you're talking about 100 milliwatt getting absorbed in your body. Yeah. Versus here, we are talking about 10 microwatt. Right. So yeah. it's 100 milliwatt versus 10. It is actually could be even safer right. from the power perspective. Though granted, it's a different frequency, but those frequencies anyway we see when we rub our hand, yeah. uh, you know, across daily objects. Yeah. Okay. Is this the um, technology that you're using in the startup you're involved with? Is it, is it pronounced Dixana? Yes, the startup is called Dixana. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the basics were done at Purdue. We um, invented this new mode called electro human body communication. Human body communication has been looked into, but the field and the theory was not very well developed. We introduced the basic equations of, uh, you know, how to bring Maxwell's equation into this field and understand how the circuit at the lower frequency, body as a circuit, yeah. looks like at lower frequencies, which led to a very deeper under, deep understanding which can guide optimized designs. And that led to, oh, how you should terminate, how should you excite, those kind of understandings. So those basic patents were filed out of Purdue, all the research happened at Purdue. Yeah. And there was a lot of pull, you know, that led to the TEDx talk, MIT TR35 award, and things like that. But once those it started to go through those news outlets. There was a lot of pull on a hundred x lower power communication around the body is going to change wearables. Yeah. So can I buy one? Right. And once that comment comes, then of course that's not the right thing to do at the university level. Right. So there were other co-founders who were full time who said, "Oh, can we do something serious?" And then we decided to found the company and uh, raise VC money through which our team has been built and. Uh, the company has then built it a uh, chip, mm -hmm. um, which is a production level chip, and takes benefit of this basic EQS SBC physics yep. by licensing the technology out of Purdue. Gotcha. Uh, so, and it has demonstrated last year. It launched last year at CES 2023, mm -hmm. and this year at CES also. Last year it demonstrated audio communication around the body. Okay. This year it demonstrated for the first time in the world. Nobody has shown this video communication around the body from a smart glass to a handheld oh, device. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, so That must be exciting to present to colleagues and just people interested, something that nobody's seen before. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, as an engineer, um, you know, as a professor, when you teach and students' eyes light up, mm -hmm. that's the biggest reward. Yeah. As an engineer, when some technology you have invented is seen by, at CES, there are like 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. And 70% of the people said this is magic. Right. That's the best day in your yeah. life. <laughs> That's great. So this, I'm sure, is a lot of the research you do is interdisciplinary. Talk about 
what other fields you might work with, and the importance of that interdisciplinary work. Absolutely. You know, I'm a strong believer of you know, today's innovation is going to be multidisciplinary. I teach that both in my class as well as to my research students. The reason is each of those, uh, you know, wireless communication, for example, a lot of people have looked into it. Mm -hmm. you, it's harder to get a 10x out of that. Whereas once you combine the biology with wireless communication and think about the basics, at that interface, there is a 10x still possible. Right. Right. So because in engineering, we have explored the siloed fields well, I think the biggest returns are now at the crossovers, which is what we are calling multidisciplinary research. Right. In my example, you know, how the body acts as a conductor, and I mean, body as a conductivity, et cetera, has been measured well. But if you talk about wearable to wearable communication mm -hmm. that needed the understanding of how does the parasitic return path capacitance look like from a floating plate to uh, ground, which is all around you. Yeah. That goes back to physics where the, a formula of, we know the formula for a parallel plate capacitor, mm -hmm. epsilon A by D. We know a formula for capacitance of a sphere to infinity. But in between, how the capacitance changes as you increase distance. Okay. And that around the human body had to be developed. So we had to kind of work with physics people and think about this parasitic capacitance. Then at a little bit higher frequency, we have to solve Max Maxwell's equation around the body. Okay. So physics and electromagnetics came together to develop the fundamentals, guiding principles of the body communication, which then is leveraged maximally by building your own chip with a modern CMOS process, riding on the semiconductor wave right. that we are benefiting yes, today. Yeah. You know, so here three different fields are coming together easily. And even in CMOS, it's a combination of mixed signal, analog and digital circuits right. to put together the whole SOC. Yeah. You know, so these four or five fields coming together to make this really possible. It would not have been possible just by designing a circuit for known physics. Right. Or just doing the physics and then, you know, it would have been a paper, but you cannot really demonstrate right. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're creating something that the world has never seen before, inevitably you hit roadblocks and things that don't work. What do you do when you hit a roadblock to kind of get around it? And how do you talk to your students about what they a lot of times consider failures? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll start with the cliche. I say that, uh, you know, fail is first attempt in learning. Oh, okay. So uh, this is not mine. You know, I have yeah. borrowed it from others. <laughs> um, but behind that is actually there is something really meaningful that we always try. For example, you know, when we started on this field of human body communication, uh, there were previous literature, you know, and the literatures were not agreeing with each other. For the same frequency, there were like difference of 60 dB, which is of orders of magnitude that people were disagreeing by. Okay. So we said, okay, what can we do? We are really stuck. So I have found the solution always to be go back to your basics okay, and trust what you know very well. And then from there, build up in incremental steps with a lot of experimentation and theory, iteration, iterating back and forth. Yeah. So develop from the basics with a lot of effort, right? So yeah. we did go back to the basics and we saw, you know, if you did grounded measurements, uh, and I'm going a little bit technical terms, you will see the loss around the body. If you put to apply one volt, you will see one volt on the other side. Okay. That was a surprise that people were saying, oh, no, there is loss. So the loss was not coming from the forward path. It was coming from the return path. Okay. That was a big revelation that nobody else had said. Yeah. So, and if I had just followed the, or our team has just followed the published literature and tried to build on it, we would have always, all, always be going in that wrong zone and not understand the fundamentals yeah. of how to break it down. Gotcha. So I think when it did not look correct and you hit a bottleneck, take a step back, go back to the basics and revisit. Right. And then if you slowly build up, then you find another path around it. Gotcha. That's what I try to teach my students as well. Yeah. Um, is research what led you to academics long term as opposed to industry? So I'll say research and teaching both. Uh, so like I was saying, um, when the eyes of the student lit up, mm -hmm. that is some that is a reward that you don't get in industry as much. Right. Right. Um, but having said that, also be able to do um, open academic research is something you do. Even even though I was in one of the top circuits research lab in, in at Intel Labs, um, 
you can do certain projects, mm-hmm. but you cannot do a lot of projects right. which is very future looking, right? It has to be aligned with the industry's business goals. Yeah. Um, so the academic freedom on projects I can choose and then take those learnings and teach students whose eyes will light up. Right. Both are equally important rewards to me. And how has engineering education changed from when you went through school to the students you're teaching today? I think students are much more uh, exposed and knowledgeable. I think maybe, you know, internet and things mm-hmm. becoming with videos. You know, we had to read a lot of books and today you will can find those concepts done over videos. That right. is much easier to uh, visualize. So I think there is a lot of information that students can draw from. And students are also uh, empowered to find those information. But because of a lot of information available, they could be more distracted as well. So I think instead of uh, what I have found is instead of, you know, drawing one diagram, it's more important to convey the insight of the diagram. The diagram is anyway available online Mm -hmm. and guide them how to go through this maze of available information and make sense out of it. Right. So the info, I think the availability of information has changed. So what we need to do instead of giving information, it's more guiding them how to process the information. Gotcha. So I assume that you had mentors that helped you along the way. Yes. Talk about how mentors helped you and how you view your responsibility now to mentor today's students. Absolutely. You know, um, starting from very early age, like I said, right, I got pulled into through my mom and maternal uncle and others. Then uh, even when I joined my bachelor's, uh, I was fortunate to meet somebody by the name of Kaushik who was, a, so a, I am in a small town in India, mm-hmm. and this person is already a faculty in US. Okay, and he had gone back to meet his teacher, to whom I was a student. Okay, and he tells me, um, you know, you need to do research. I said, oh, what is research? Yeah, right. <laughs> so you know, I'm just a 12th grade student in a small town in India. Right. <laughs> what is research? Um, and that exposure led me to do a lot of research, even starting from my first year in undergrad. That has changed and defined my life. Gotcha. Right? So then going forward, the next generation of mentors who had helped me to, you know, come to uh, Purdue and Georgia Tech and then next generation of mentors who brought me to Intel mm-hmm. so th- and then who brought me back to Purdue. Right. So, uh, yes, I have immensely benefited from mentors throughout and I continue to benefit today. So what I feel my responsibility is. And, you know, we all who are in engineering and all Purdue students will get a very good job and make a good living. Right. That's, there is no question about that. That's Purdue, right? Yep. But a lot of, if you could find a calling in your work, such as is beyond your salary. Right. Then the drive to do the work is better. And also the reward that you get out of doing your work is better. Yeah. You should not be doing it for the salary. You should be doing it even if without the salary. Right. right. And then the salary is just a nice benefit. Gotcha. I feel I try to inculcate that thought in the students I interact with that find your passion and drive forward. I try to give examples and then, you know, for my research students, I try to show them what they're trying to do, you know, kind of make a dent in the sphere of knowledge, Mm -hmm. human knowledge. Yeah. So I try to impair at that level and those who see that, I see them put in much more effort right. and be much more rewarded simultaneously. Gotcha. Uh, so that's what I'm trying. So when you're looking at research students, potential research students, what qualities do you look for in an individual that leads you to believe they'll be successful? Absolutely. Um, hunger and aptitude. Okay. Just these two bits, everything. You know, um, you can... I have seen a lot of smart people who are not that hungry. And then that doesn't, you know, their progress would be generally slower. Right. If you are motivated about what you really want to do, and of course the aptitude part and the intelligence part is required, then you can navigate faster, right? It's like the hunger is the pull. Right. And the aptitude defines how fast can you can you move. That makes so those sense. are the two things I look for. I think that's probably true for every industry where yes. there's a lot of very smart people in the world that can't get motivated or find the right direction to Correct. do what they want to do. Uh, besides your body internet, your wireless internet, what other things in the field of electrical and computer engineering or engineering in general excite you? 
Yeah, the first thing is, you know, even for the body internet, it's an application. The basic thing I'm doing is basically semiconductors and mixed signal semiconductor based design, right? So we have, at Purdue is leading some of the new semiconductor efforts, the chipset, et cetera. Uh, we are the most active group within Purdue that does tape out. We do it for a lot of tape outs every year. So that's the crux I'm working on, uh, many digital and mixed signal designs to tape out. Um, body internet is one application of it. Okay. The next big application that I have been looking into is the sec microelectronic security. Uh, and that's where Purdue is also playing a key role. And our team in the field of side channel attacks, mm -hmm. uh, where you know you can look at sniff from side channel information and b try to bake keys of your phone and computer. There we have brought in a lot of new concepts on what can you do at the circuit level to protect from the such attacks. And that has led to you know creating a um, so ISSCC, International Solicitor Circuit Conference, which is the premier conference for presenting these semiconductor ICs. Yep. Uh, this year, uh, there was a new subcommittee formed on security. And as one of the founding members, so that field of microelectronic security enabled by application-specific ICs is something I'm very passionate about, along with the body internet. Um, so uh, were your parents, uh, going back a little bit, were either of your parents engineers or inclined towards that kind of problem solving? Yeah, so the second later one, um, no, none of them are engineers by training. Uh, my father is a physics honors, okay. so he has a physics background. Whereas my mother is actually in very engineering inclined. She's always, you know, breaking and making things. <laughs> right. Uh, back in India, that those days, you know, she didn't get the opportunity to study science. But, um, you know, if she had studied science, I thinks you would have made a very fantastic engineer. It's great that you had that at home because she recognized it in you and then right. encouraged it. So um, what makes Purdue ECE different than other programs, maybe both as a faculty member and for the students? Yeah, so as a faculty, uh, so one thing is, you know, we are the largest ECE right now. Yeah. And I have been the fortune of being involved in the two largest EC departments of the country. I was, I'm a Georgia Tech alumni. Yeah. When I was at Georgia Tech, it used to be the largest right. EC department. Now Purdue is the largest EC department. So the largeness brings a lot of opportunities. You have multiple domain experts for every given domain. Right. Right. So that's an opportunity for both faculty and students. Faculty as a colleague, like, you know, if I'm working on a very multidisciplinary problem, I am not an expert. I know the core well, but mm -hmm. then as I need to explore it everywhere, I have at least two or three colleagues in each do domain right. where I can go and seek, okay, how does that work? Yeah. You know, and have collaborative projects. Same for students as they, you know, need to grow in, okay, I'm finding, they have more opportunities and more projects to find and fine tune their career directions. Yeah. Um, similarly, even for lower level classes, you know, there are multiple sections and different faculty teach it differently. Right. So they have the opportunity to get more different kinds of exposures, right? So I think uh, large systems are harder to manage, of course, yeah. but once it's managed well, it creates opportunities that smaller systems cannot create. Yeah, and I think we're in a pretty exciting time just in the field of electrical and computer engineering where a lot of things are just starting to explode and Purdue EC is, is in a good position to be a leader exactly. in that. Um, so outside of the lab, which I know you enjoy, and that's, you know, mostly fun for you, what other things do you do in your free time uh, to, what do you like to do? Um, this is, I have not spoken about this, uh, you know, a lot online, but one of my big hobbies is riding a motorcycle. Oh. <laughs> so I. In what kind of motorcycle I, do you have? I have a Kawasaki Ninja 650. Okay. So it's a sports bike. So yeah, I ride around in the summer as much as I can, and also uh, traveling uh, a lot. You know, so those are my two big hobbies. And I know you have a two-year-old son. Do you see any engineering? That's little, but do you see any of those qualities in him? Absolutely, it might be too early to say, but you know, the DNA I see in my mom of making not stopping for a minute and trying to create something all the time, right. and she does it even today. Yeah. And that's what I see in me and the same DNA I see in my son uh, that he doesn't want to see title for a second. And mm -hmm. always he's, oh, what can I do? Right. So would you be excited if he decided to go into engineering or you just want him 
to do what I think he wants I to do. I want to, like I was saying earlier, I want to find his calling mm-hmm. and pursue that yeah. and be happy with whatever his calling is. It may happen because of the DNA that it is engineering. Right. But if that is something else, I would be happy if he finds that and pursues it. Gotcha. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Shreyas. It was it was a great conversation. Likewise. Thank you for organizing it. And thank you for tuning in to Engineering Innovations, the podcast where we explore the forefront of electrical and computer engineering. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes and leave a review to help us make the podcast even better. Until next time, stay connected with Purdue University's Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering on our website or social media. You can check the show notes for that information. And again, thanks for taking the time to listen. We'll have another episode next month.